We now want to talk about the functional categories of the neurons. We divide neurons into three major functional types based upon what their function is. We talk about number one, sensory or afferent neurons. And on the next page, S4, we talk about interneurons or association neurons. And the third class are called motor neurons or efferent uh, neurons. Those are the three functional classes. Let's go through each of these. Starting back on page S3. So what are sensory or afferent neurons? Sensory or afferent neurons are neurons that transmit information from your body to your brain and spinal cord. That is the input signal. Sensory or afferent neurons transmit the information from your various parts of your body to uh, the, your brain or spinal cord. This information is coming into your central nervous system, so that provides the input signal. We've mentioned that sensory neurons commonly have a unipolar shape, and we've just described that. We further subdivide sensory neurons into two subtypes, somatic sensory neurons and visceral sensory neurons. Somatic sensory neurons are sensory neurons that send information from our skin or skeletal muscles to the central nervous system, to the spinal cord and brain. Interestingly, this information from uh, carried by our somatic sensory neurons from our skin or skeletal muscles to our central nervous system, this information typically reaches consciousness. Consciousness mean, means awareness. Consciousness means awareness, meaning we are aware of this sensations from our skin, the surface of our body, and from our skeletal muscles. We can feel it. Now, in contrast, visceral sensory neurons, and we remember that the word visceral refers to internal organs. So visceral sensory neurons send information from our internal organs inside of our body uh, to our central nervous system, to our spinal cord and brain. And this information generally, and there are some exceptions, but typically doesn't reach consciousness, meaning we do not feel it. So let's kind of get a sense of what we're talking about here. Let's take a look at a picture on page S17. Here on the top right uh, of page S17, what are we looking at? This is the brain, here is the spinal cord, and it shows sensory neurons here. And they are sensory neurons, and the arrows indicate that they are sending action potentials, nerve impulses, electrical signals, from various parts of the body to the spinal cord, or brain. So these are sensory neurons, or afferent neurons, providing an input signal. Now, here looking at these uh, uh, two examples, this is labeled a somatic sensory neuron, providing an input signal, and this one here is labeled a visceral sensory neuron. Remember that somatic sensory neurons that's the term we use for those sensory neurons that send information from either the skin or the skeletal muscles, and they send that information to our spinal cord and brain, to our central nervous system. This information reaches consciousness. We generally feel it. Here it shows a visceral sensory neuron sending information from the stomach uh, to the spinal cord. In general, we do not feel most of this information from our internal organs going to our spinal cord and brain. Let's uh, kind of think about this. If somebody were to put an ice cube on your skin, would you feel it? And the answer is yes, obviously. If somebody touches your skin, uh, would you feel it? Of course, you. we are aware we feel sensations from our skin. Now, what about skeletal muscles? What I'd like you to do is to wiggle your toes. Wiggle your toes. Make your toes move. Can, are they moving? Can you feel them moving? The obvious answer is yes, you can feel your toes moving. Don't you have to go and take your shoes off to make sure? The answer is no. You can feel when your toes move. Now let's try moving your shoulders. Move your shoulders. Can, are they moving? 
You'd say, yes, I can feel them move. Well, don't you have to look in a mirror to make sure? No, because you can feel when your shoulders move. So we have learned previously that this sensation of movement occurring in your skeletal muscles is called proprioception or kinesthesia. We originally learned the term proprioception and kinesthesia way back on page H3. On page H3 at the bottom, we talked about proprioceptors, sensory neurons associated with our skeletal muscles that allow us the sensation of kinesthesia, the sensation of movement. And it's also known as proprioception. So yes, you should go back and review that information that we learned some time ago. All right, so we feel sensations of uh, occurring on our skin, and we feel sensations associated with movement of our skeletal muscles. Now, on the other hand, what about our internal organs? Can you feel when your liver secretes bile? The answer is no. Can you feel your kidneys filtering the blood right at this moment? Can you feel it? The answer is no. Can you feel when your pancreas secretes pancreatic juice and releases it into the pancreatic duct, which carries it to your small intestine? Can you feel that? The answer is no. So uh, can, you feel, can you feel when your gallbladder contracts and releases a volume of bile? The answer is no. In other words, we generally do not feel much sensation from our internal organs. Now, uh, the major exception, the major exception to that is injury to our internal organs causing pain. If there is injury to our internal organs, we will feel pain, but in general, we don't really feel our internal organs functioning or working. If everything's going well, we really have almost no awareness of what they're doing. And that's actually a good thing. Can you imagine what it would feel like if you could feel all of your internal organs working? You could feel your pancreas and liver and kidneys and gallbladder all secreting and producing and releasing. You would be overwhelmed with all these sensations from your internal organs. What we want to focus our attention on is the world around us. And that, uh, and that involves our skin and our skeletal muscles through which we affect the external world around us. All right, those are the two types of sensory or afferent neurons, somatic sensory and visceral sensory neurons. Returning back to S4. So on page S4, the second functional class of neurons were interneurons. Interneurons is the name we use for those neurons located entirely within the brain and spinal cord, within the central nervous system. These neurons generally have a multipolar shape, but not always. Commonly they do. And what are the functions of these interneurons in our brain and spinal cord? They are used for thinking, for remembering, and they are used for making decisions, among other things. That's what we use the interneurons in, within our brain and spinal cord for. Returning back to our picture on S17, on S17, so here uh, are neurons located in the brain and in the spinal cord. Uh, these are called interneurons. And what are interneurons used for? Thinking, memory, and decision making, among other things. All right, returning back to S4. Back on S4, the third functional class of neurons are called motor neurons, or efferent neurons. They, the function of motor neurons is to send signals, action potentials, that command our organs to do something. They activate our organs, our effector organs. Now, motor neurons always have a multipolar shape. There are no exceptions. They all have a multipolar shape. We further subdivide motor neurons into two subtypes. And yes, we have learned about this previously. We talk about somatic motor neurons and autonomic motor neurons. Somatic motor neurons are the motor neurons that uh, permit voluntary control of our skeletal muscles. 
In contrast, autonomic motor neurons are not under voluntary control. The word autonomic is, uh, means autonomous. It is similar to the word automatic. These autonomic motor neurons automatically control our visceral smooth muscle and cardiac muscle and glands associated with our internal organs. So they automatically control the visceral smooth muscle in the walls of our stomach. Uh, they automatically control the cardiac muscle of the heart. They automatically control uh, secretions by the salivary glands and the sweat glands and the other various glands in our body. To visualize this, let's again return to our picture on S17. So on S17, so on S17, this time we're going to look right here where it says motor output. These are motor neurons. They are sending uh, signals out of the central nervous system, away from the spinal cord and brain, out to the organs of our body. These are the effector organs. Now we have two types of motor neurons. We have somatic motor neurons and autonomic motor neurons. Somatic motor neurons permit voluntary control over our skeletal muscles. Autonomic motor neurons automatically control visceral smooth muscle in the walls of our internal organs, automatically control the cardiac muscle of our heart, and automatically control the various glands of our body, such as the salivary glands and sweat glands. So motor neurons, whether it's somatic or autonomic, activate and control our the organs of our body. It's always easy to determine whether particular movement involves a skeletal muscle controlled by a somatic motor neuron or whether it's an internal organ controlled by an autonomic motor neuron. All we have to do is ask ourselves, do we have voluntary control over it? So let's try wiggling our fingers. Obviously, if we can wiggle them, we can stop. Go ahead and move them, stop. You have voluntary control over the skeletal muscles in your fingers. They are controlled by somatic motor neurons that are under voluntary control. How about your tongue? Is your tongue made up of skeletal muscle controlled by somatic motor neurons, or is it made up of visceral smooth muscle controlled by autonomic motor neurons? Let's find out. Go ahead, try moving your tongue. Go. Stop. Move it again. So you have voluntary control over the movement of your tongue. So inside your tongue are skeletal muscles, and they are controlled by somatic motor neurons. You can send signals through your somatic motor neurons and control the action of those skeletal muscles in your tongue. Let's try breathing. Are, are our breathing muscles, such as the diaphragm muscle, Skeletal muscles controlled by somatic motor neurons, or are they visceral smooth muscle controlled by autonomic motor neurons? Let's try uh, breathing real fast and then stop. Go ahead, breathe fast, go. Stop. Go. Stop. Well, because you have voluntary control, uh, they are skeletal muscles controlled by somatic motor neurons. Now, you might say, but Professor Fink, I can't just hold my breath. I can't stop breathing. Uh, at a certain point, I'll start to breathe. That's correct. You have inside your brain something that I refer to as an idiot override. If you're sitting there thinking, you know, I'm going to just stop breathing and kill myself, at a certain point, your brain's going to say you're an idiot, and it will make you start breathing. Furthermore, as we've learned back when we were talking about skeletal muscles, Back on page H1, we learned that uh, all of our skeletal muscles can be controlled both through a voluntary and an involuntary pathway. There is a voluntary activation of our somatic motor neurons, and there's also an involuntary activation of them. So we can use the voluntary pathway to control our uh, breathing muscles. We can use the, allow the involuntary pathway to control our breathing and not even think about it. We're looking at the picture at the bottom of S17, and what we're looking at is a nerve coming off the spinal cord. So this is really a spinal nerve.
We have described a nerve like a telephone cable. And just as a telephone cable may have hundreds of thousands or even millions of wires inside of it, similarly inside a nerve are hundreds of thousands or millions of very thin, microscopically thin nerve fibers within it. Now, uh, in the picture, it uh, shows uh, two nerve fibers. Uh, this one is labeled unmyelinated, and this one is labeled myelinated. Some of the nerve fibers within a nerve are just plain nerve fibers, and some have a myelin sheath or covering around them. The analogy I like to give is the difference between a bare copper wire and a wire that has a plastic covering over it. Now, they don't have a plastic covering. What they actually have are myelinating cells wrapped around them. We pointed out that these myelinating cells, uh, when they are wrapped around a nerve fiber, cause the induction velocity, the speed at which the action potential travels, to be faster than those that are unmyelinated. We will, again, have more to say about that. There are four types of nerve fibers that are typically found in every spinal nerve. All right, we're looking at this uh, spinal nerve, and what I've done is I've drawn four lines uh, within that spinal nerve to represent the four functional types of nerve fibers contained within a spinal nerve. So you'll notice I've drawn a, a blue line, a green line, a red line, and an orange line. They don't have to be those colors. It's just to represent or designate four diff functional different types of nerve fibers. There are two types of sensory neurons uh, that are typically found in all spinal nerves. Sensory neurons, uh, of course, send information to the central nervous system, to the spinal cord and brain. I've drawn arrowheads pointing in this direction. This is the input signal. This is the signal going in. And so what are the two types of sensory neurons that send information from the organs of our body to the spinal cord, to the central nervous system? There are somatic sensory neurons and visceral sensory neurons. The somatic sensory neurons uh, send information from the skin and skeletal muscle uh, to the central nervous system, and the visceral sensory neurons send uh, sensory information from the visceral or internal organs uh, of the body to the spinal cord, to the central nervous system. Also, we've drawn a red line and an orange line. These are motor neurons, and motor neurons are sending commands. They are controlling uh, the effector organs of our body. These are action potentials or signals going away from the central nervous system uh, out to the organs of the body. We've written that there are somatic motor neurons and there are autonomic motor neurons. Remember that somatic motor neurons permit voluntary control over skeletal muscle, whereas autonomic motor neurons automatically control our internal organs. So inside of our spinal nerves, there are hundreds of thousands, millions of each of these four types of nerve fibers. Thousands of somatic sensory neurons, thousands of visceral sensory neurons, thousands, hundreds of thousands of somatic motor neurons and autonomic motor neurons that are sending information in and sen sending commands out. That's what's in the nerves, uh, which are associated with the peripheral nervous system. Let's try to summarize all of this by looking at a diagram on page S19. S19 will put the whole story together. The organization of the nervous system. We divide the nervous system into two main divisions. The central nervous system, or CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, or PNS. The central nervous system, by and large, everybody understands that. That is made up of the brain and spinal cord. What did we call the neurons that are located entirely within our brain and spinal cord? We said those are called interneurons. And what do we use these interneurons within our brain and spinal cord for? They are used for thinking, for memory, and for decision making, among other things. Okay, that's the central nervous system. 
Okay, what about the peripheral nervous system? This is usually where students go, what is that? The peripheral nervous system is made up of those cranial nerves coming off the brain and the spinal nerves coming off the spinal cord. That's what we wrote. Cranial and spinal nerves are inside the peripheral nervous system. So that's what we wrote. The cranial nerves and spinal nerves, that's what makes up our peripheral nervous system, or PNS. And what have we learned are located inside these nerves? We've said that there are two types of sensory neurons, somatic sensory neurons and visceral sensory neurons. And we've said that there are two types of motor neurons inside those nerves, somatic motor neurons and autonomic motor neurons. That's what we've shown you on page S17. On S17, we said inside these spinal nerves are somatic sensory neurons, visceral sensory neurons, somatic motor neurons, and autonomic motor neurons. You can see another view of this right here. So here's the somatic sensory neuron and visceral sensory neurons. They are inside every single spinal nerve, sending information in. And also inside every nerve are somatic motor neurons and autonomic motor neurons that are controlling those organs. Those are what are located in the peripheral nervous system. Now, we're not going to get into in this anatomy class, but what you will get into in physiology is that the autonomic motor neurons are further subdivided into two subtypes, uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic motor neurons. One of those autonomic motor neurons acts to slow the organ down, and the other autonomic motor neuron acts to speed the organ up. We're looking now at the top of S2. And on the top of S2, many of the cells associated with the nervous system are not actually neurons or nerve cells. We have been talking about neurons but in fact, there are other cells that are not neurons that are part of the nervous system. So these cells that are not neurons, but located within the brain and spinal cord within the central nervous system are collectively known as neuroglial cells or glial cells. They are present in the central nervous system. Uh, they make up about half the cells in our brain and spinal cord. Uh, there are actually four types of glial cells. Uh, the main one that we want to emphasize are the oligodendroglial cells, also known as oligodendrocytes. These are the cells that form the myelin covering, the, uh, uh, the myelin sheath that is wrapped around some of the interneurons in the central nervous system. Remember that those neurons that have this myelin covering wrapped around it conduct action potentials at a faster speed or faster velocity. In addition, there are other glial cells, including astrocytes. Uh, the astrocytes are glial cells that surround the capillaries in the central nervous system. They are responsible for creating what is called a blood-brain barrier between the bloodstream and the neurons. And they also play a key role in providing nourishment uh, for the neurons. And we're increasingly learning more about uh, the important role of these astrocytes in the uh, health of these neurons in our brain and spinal cord. There are also microglial cells. Microglial cells are phagocytes. They are phagocytic cells inside our brain and spinal cord that swallow up bad guys, bacteria and viral particles. And for, uh, fourthly, there are the appendable cells. The appendable cells are cells that are associated with the choroid plexus. Uh, the choroid plexus, of course, is the vascularized membrane that produces the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, within these ventricles or chambers of the brain, and the appendable cells are associated with that. There are also supporting cells uh, in the peripheral nervous system. These four glial cells were in the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. There is one important type of supporting cell in the peripheral nervous system. They're called Schwann cells, after Dr. Schwann. 
These Schwann cells form the myelin covering that is wrapped around some of the sensory neurons and motor neurons that are in the nerves of the peripheral nervous system. So let's just clarify that. Uh, if we uh, look again on page S17, on the bottom right on page S17, so here it shows these myelinating cells forming this myelin covering, this myelin covering around a nerve fiber. In this particular case, this happens to be labeled a Schwann cell. So remember, Schwann cells form the myelin covering around sensory neurons and motor neurons. There are always uh, spaces between these myelinating cells. These little gaps or spaces are called nodes of Ranvier. So when we have myelinating cells, whether it's a myelinated sensory neuron or myelinated motor neuron that is inside a nerve, which is part of the peripheral nervous system, we call the myelinating cells Schwann cells. If, the, if we're looking at a myelinating cell wrapped around an inner neuron in the brain or spinal cord, it's called an oligodendrocyte or oligodendroglial cell. Let's just look at one more picture. This is page S22. We notice that on this neuron, it has a myelin covering. And uh, if this myelinating cell is wrapped around either a sensory neuron or a motor neuron, it's called a Schwann cell, which this one is. Remember that there are little gaps or spaces between these myelinating cells called nodes of Ranvier. Uh, in physiology, you'll learn the important role of these myelinating cells and the nodes of Ranvier in causing an increase conduction velocity of the action potential. If this had been an interneuron in the central nervous system, we would have called these myelinating cells oligodendroglial cells or oligodendrocytes. They pretty much look the same and have a similar function to the Schwann cells that are wrapped around sensory neurons and motor neurons. We summarized all this on page S3. In the middle of the page on S3, we summarized that the oligodendroglial uh, myelinating cells are wrapped around inner neurons in the central nervous system, whereas the Schwann myelinating cells are wrapped around the sensory neurons and motor neurons in the peripheral nervous system. And of course, the spaces between these myelinating cells are called nodes of Ranvier. The shape and appearance and function of these myelinating cells is essentially the same whether we're talking about oligodendroglia or Schwann cells.